People have been crossing through this area since forever. A lot of the areas that we work are actually routes that people would migrate through seasonally. A lot of the folks whose land this is, the Taunatum and Yaqui people. But more recently, the whole idea is, you know, to get from Mexico to the U.S. I'm a volunteer with the organization No More Deaths. We are a non-hierarchical, consensus-based group, and we do humanitarian aid in the border regions. We put out water on known migrant trails. We also do search and rescue. We document abuses by Border Patrol and different organizations, and we also provide assistance to people who have been deported and provide um, harm reduction kits for people who are gonna be crossing the desert. As we've expanded our work, we've expanded the areas that we're working in, and that includes some of the areas in the West Desert, around Ajo, Arizona, where people are walking across Oregon Pipe National Monument onto Cabeza Prieta National Wildlife Refuge, and then across about 20 miles of active bombing range. The journey north has changed a lot in the last 15 years. The urban centers were sealed in the mid-90s, pushing people out into the geography of the desert. It's a very intentional strategy on the part of the U.S. government and Border Patrol to increase human suffering and death along the border as an ostensive deterrent. Over the years, we've also seen uh, the areas that we've done water drops and the areas that we've seen water drops moving have also become more remote. Essentially what we've done is we've mapped north-south trails and then we'll drive roads and do drops. But a lot of the drops that are closer to roads, we've just seen a really big uptick in vandalism. And we've also seen an increased um, amount of use in extremely remote areas. A lot of migrants get separated from their guides because the Border Patrol dusts them. A helicopter will come um, and fly very close to a group. People will scatter, get separated from their guides, and in this manner get lost and frequently spend weeks walking in circles. Folks generally travel at night. The pace of the group is very quick. If folks can't keep up with the group, they're frequently left behind. So a lot of the um, patients that we get at camp are very close to death when we find them. There's also been an increase in militarization in uh, the immigration enforcement in Mexico. So Mexico actually deported more Central Americans last year than the United States did. And part of that is with U.S. support through Plan Frontera Sur. Um, the United States is actually funding the Mexican government to implement border security on their southern border with Guatemala. I've talked to people who were riding the train and then to get around checkpoints walked for eight or nine days in Mexico. So by the time they get here, they've often traveled for over a month. Being identified as a migrant in Mexico from further south makes people vulnerable um, to extortion, kidnapping, and assault. I would say many of the women who have made it to the U.S.-Mexico border have experienced some form of traumatic violence um, during their journey. The goal is for people to have such a devastating and traumatic experience crossing that they are deterred from further attempts. It's very short-sighted and it does not take into account the reasons that people are migrating north. A lot of the reasons that folks are coming from Central America have to do with U.S. economic and foreign policy now and in the past. One of the things that happens under the auspice of democracy building with things like Plan Frontera Sur or the Merida Initiative is that the U.S. government is funding military and by extension paramilitary in torture techniques and repression of social movements. So not only is it keeping people from traveling north to escape violence, it's actually creating and perpetuating more violence. If you look at um, the School of the Americas and the funding of uh, the Mexican military to, to fight terrorism and to fight drugs. One of the groups, the Zetas, was initially a, an arm of the Mexican military, and then they decided to break off and kind of took over the drug trade in Texas and in Matamoros and Tamalipas, and they've actually become one of the most violent gangs, and they were trained and funded and given guns by the U.S. government. It's like a joint business venture between the U.S. government and cartels. They have similar interests and they are exploiting vulnerable populations for money through different routes. Cartels make money because people have to contract with them now to cross and then the U.S. government and private corporations make money by incarcerating undocumented people before deporting them. There's a group called the American Legislative Exchange Council comprised of Republican legislators and corporate interests and one of the corporations involved in this group is the 
Corrections Corporations of America, one of the largest private prison groups in the country, they got together and they wrote SB 1070, which was the law in Arizona that got passed a few years ago that deputized police to check immigration status. We live in the border zone. Within 100 miles of the border, police and Border Patrol have always had discretion to do whatever they want. But this kind of took that experience with the borderlands and internalized it and expanded it to all of Arizona and then with copycat laws that were passed to other parts of the country. It makes the risk of deportation that much higher. So if you know an employer refuses to pay their employee and they want to seek justice, it you know it's really easy for an employer to just threaten calling ICE on them and it creates an extremely, extremely vulnerable population. And that seems very intentional because it definitely benefits a lot of companies who are able to exploit this group of people that are now here.